not as punishment for sin or as a way of appeasing an angry God, but as a spiritual practice akin to prayer that allows us to clear away the clutter of our lives and be more open to hearing the voice of God in our lives as a way that we who are choking on abundance in this culture might hold at bay for just a moment our, our gluttony and our greed so that the winds of God's Holy Spirit might blow justice and compassion into our lives. That the same winds that moved over the face of the deep, the Ruach of God might blow into our communities and into our lives. Thank you. It is such a pleasure to be here tonight and to be with my friends uh, from the Institute and to see colleagues uh, here in this room from the different faith traditions. And particularly, it's auspicious uh, for me to be here tonight because in just a few short weeks, the Jewish community will be moving into its own period of fasting. And it will not be as rigorous as that of Ramadan. However, uh, to us, it is far more difficult because we're the ones doing it. <laughs> the truth is, fasting is not easy. It was never intended to be. It is truly the affliction of the soul. It is chosen as the means of reaching a moment of religious oneness with God precisely because we are deprived of the other senses that distract us from encountering God. So naturally, it's challenging and it is meant to be. There are different kinds of fast in Judaism. Uh, Bishop Reinhardt has, of course, captured the biblical origins of fasting. I'm not going to repeat that, but there are different kinds of fast in Judaism, as I suspect there are in other religious traditions. For example, there are the fasts which help us remember historic events that were very painful to our people. We think back to moments in the national history of the Jewish faith. It's an old faith, as you know. It goes back 3,000 years. And there were horrific events that took place in the course of time. And so on the remembrance dates of those events, there are many Jews who fast. They fast first out of oneness with those who perished, those who suffered. Even centuries later, we remember them. And there are others among us who fast because there is a sense in Judaism that we bear some responsibility for some of the things that did happen. We did not perhaps stand up as tall as we might have. We were not as vigorous in defense of our people as we could have been. Not us, but our ancestors. And so we take some responsibility. Now, there are some in the Jewish world today who say, no, we shouldn't take responsibility. We weren't there, number one. And number two, what happened to us, the people who should be fasting are those who did it to us. Not us, the victims, if you will. But you know, the theology of Judaism is that all things come from God. And therefore, if we suffered at some point in history, then that's part of God's decree. God saw some flaw in us as a people and therefore sent others to punish us. And so we still remember today what might have been, how we should have acted so that God might have averted the decree against us. That's one kind of fast. Then there are the other kinds of fast for the kinds of things that I think all of us deal with, where we've done something we really know what we've done. It's a secret. It's something in our hearts. We scratched somebody's fender, but we didn't leave a note. You might say, well, how do you respond to that? A rabbi might say, fast today. Not 25 hours, not a week. Show some kind of contrition in your heart. If you can't do anything about it, you can't correct it then at least show some kind of heartfelt contrition before the only one who knows you did it, and that's God in heaven. And so we have these minor fasts, which are very personal, and sometimes they play a part in many people's lives. And then we have perhaps the most serious of fasts, and that is the fast we are about to observe, which is the fast of Yom Kippur. And earlier in the summer, we had the fast of Tisha B'Av. The fast of Tisha B'Av, which took place this year in July, uh, reminds us of the catastrophe of Jewish life in the year 586 BCE and then repeated in the year 70 of the Common Era. And that was the destruction of the temples in Jerusalem and the end of Jewish sovereignty in the Holy Land. And there, that is a day, those days, which took place on the same day in the Jewish calendar. Um, those days have become very painful ones for the Jewish people for 2,000 years. Today, there are some who argue that that particular fast of Tisha B'Av in the summer should be, in a sense, waived, because with the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel in modern times, 
it seems to some we have gone full circle and the fast no longer has meaning. Others would disagree. And then coming up in just a few weeks, the great fast of all, and that is the fast of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. This is the biblically ordained fast in which the God of Israel says that there comes this day each year when you shall afflict your souls and you shall seek repentance from God. One of the ways we do that is we must go to the person we might have hurt or offended or wounded. If somebody has been wronged by us, we must go to them on Yom Kippur and we must ask their forgiveness. And for sins we have committed against God, we must ask God in heaven to forgive us. And that is done through prayer. But the setting for this contrition is the fast itself, which is a 25-hour fast. It begins the night at sunset and continues to the following night at sunset. That's a long fast. And it's a powerful fast. And it's a fast which is the most widely honored fast in all of Jewish life. In fact, whether you fast or whether you celebrate Yom Kippur is the litmus test of just where you stand in relationship to the Jewish community. It's a measure, if you will. Those who come but don't fast, okay, you're a little estranged. Those who don't come, don't fast, you're a lot estranged. Those who come and do both, you're knee deep in the club. The fast really is a sacrifice. Are you prepared to make it? So one day a year we ask that of every Jew. On this day, look inside your soul, ask forgiveness of those you've wounded, ask forgiveness of God in heaven, and then write whatever you did wrong. Indeed, the passage from Isaiah, which the bishop quoted, is indeed the instructive passage of Yom Kippur. On that day, we actually read this passage in which God says, as the bishop correctly noted, of course, that what kind of fast is this when you stand here and just say, I'm not going to eat, okay? No, that's not enough of a fast. The fast really has to lead to action. It has to be that while you're sitting there hungry, that you're thinking about those who are hungry every day thinking about those who are in need of food, not just on this day of atonement, but tomorrow and the day after. Do something about it, now that you know what hunger feels like. And don't walk around the synagogue on Yom Kippur saying, look at me, I can eat, go without food for 25 hours. I'm somebody special. Okay, you're nobody special. You're just a person who has deprived himself for one day, but why? If it's only to show you can do it, no. If it's to show that you have a a drive for contrition of the heart, that you are really using this distraction from food to look inside yourself to see how I can be what God created me to be, and that you're going to set out come the breakfast to change and to become that person that you have been born to become, then that is the fast that God seeks from you. And so that is why that fast has particular importance to every Jew. Uh, regardless of whether he is observant year-round, regardless whether he keeps kosher or doesn't keep kosher, uh, honors the Sabbath or not, on Yom Kippur you come to look at yourself as a Jew and as a human being and to ask yourself, who am I in God's eyes? Who am I in my own eyes? The fast of Yom Kippur, as I said, is a 25-hour fast, and I'll close just by describing it to you. We are in prayer all day. So in addition to not eating for 25 hours, we are actually in the synagogue for almost all those hours, except we do go home to sleep. But the night before and all the next day, from 8.30 in the morning to roughly 8 o'clock at night, we are in constant prayer, one service after another. Everyone must fast. There are exceptions made. We have a tradition in Judaism which says that your physical health and well-being overrides any commandment in the Bible which is to say that if your doctor says you're not well enough to fast, you may not fast. And we encourage children to begin fasting when they're young and to grow bit by bit in length of the fast as they grow older. The sense in the community as we gather together in our congregation on Yom Kippur is enormously powerful. We'll have thousands and thousands of people in our synagogue filling it from front to rear. Every room of the synagogue is filled with people who are fasting and in prayer. For 25 hours each year, our entire community comes together. This is the day.